I was just like standing backstage for the last five minutes, being like, do I go out, do I go out now? <laughs> um, okay, it's called Story. So I'm going to start with a little story about Nashville. And this sort of dovetails nicely with my talk. But like when I first moved to New York City, I was just like this hack high school dropout, screw up of a kid. And I was just hustling for work and hustling for work. I met this like really important guy who had this TV network. And it was sort of like a cable access TV network. And he was opening up a new cable access channel in Aspen, Colorado. And he came to my brother and me and he was like, hey, um, why don't you go out there and make us a bunch of little movies that we'll show on the cable access channel in Colorado. Make them about the, about the town. And we're like, cool, that sounds fun. And he was like, um, just do me a favor. Make sure it's respectable. <laughs> um, so we took the budget, like the whole budget, and instead of flying out to Colorado and making videos, we bought like this big 1987 Ford Econoline van, and then we put two mini bikes in the back that we ordered from China, and we thought that we'd recreate Dumb and Dumber, where they like, <laughs> where they, like drive to Aspen, um, and then we like painted, I know, we like painted on the side of the van, we just wrote like the respectability tour. <laughs> but we... Long story long, we had only a couple of days and we looked at a map and we're like, okay, New York City, Aspen, Colorado, what are the cities that we absolutely want to see between here and there? And the first stop was Nashville, Tennessee. So it's good to be back. Uh, story, story. How many people here... Um, Oh, I told them I would not be subtle about this. I'm not about to play a video, so don't change anything. How many people here work in the advertising industry in one way or another? Okay, that's not very many. Okay. I do. Like, that's sort of the only way that I... In one way or another, the only way that I make money is, like, I either do branded content, I work directly with brands, I work with agencies. I've been doing this for 15 years. Even my YouTube channel, like, all the revenue from that is based on ads going in front of it. That said, I hate the advertising industry. <laughs> I hate it. Um, and one of the reasons why I hate it is because they take all the really good words. Like, who decided that advertising people get to be called creatives. Not artists, not filmmakers or writers and musicians. They're not creatives. People who make commercials are creatives. And I said this once to like a, um, like a really important ad man. He was like, I was like, why? Why do you get to call yourself that? And he's like, we're good at marketing. I was like, oh. <laughs> you got me. Um, I bring that up because a couple years ago, the, the, like the buzzword in advertising was um, experience. Everybody had to create an experience. Let's do an experience. Let's do, and right now the buzzword in advertising, which I just hate, the buzzword is story. And I hate that. I hate it. Um, <laughs> I hate it. Um, because not everything is, is a story. And also, I think that, um, I think stories are precious and stories have to be protected. And when I think of what a story means to me, like my brain goes to very, very like, I remember my grandpa like telling me these like really moving, fantastical little stories when I was a kid. And I, I think of like movies that have moved me and I think of like Bob Dylan lyrics that have changed me. That's what I think of when I think of stories, not some fucking Dove commercial. <laughs> Um, so I, I hope there's nobody from Dove here also. There goes my chances for working for Dove. Um, so my version of Facebook and Minecraft and these things that I now mindlessly spend like 10 hours a day staring at my phone doing, my version of that was playing on the railroad tracks as a kid. Um, digging underground forts, which my God, what were my parents thinking? The idea of underground and fort and children is just a recipe for disaster. But this is what I did. My hands were dirty as a kid. I was always in trouble. I was always breaking things. We thought it was hysterical right after Christmas when mom told us to get rid of the Christmas tree to set it up on the railroad tracks then run extension cords so it could be lit when the train smashes into it. <laughs> like, this is, this is what my childhood was. And, you know, when I was... 
when I was 15 years old, and 14 years old, and, and I was the one who discovered that you know, my, my mother was no longer being faithful to my father, and I had to tell my father about it, and it led to the two of them getting a divorce, and things got really messed up at home, and I ran away at age 15. Like, at the time, that was like, that's a horrifying thing to tell. Like, you guys got quiet real fast. But I have such appreciation that I had that. I remember being 15, it was freezing cold, I was marching in Connecticut, walking down the street with like a backpack, having no idea where I was going at nine o'clock at night on a Tuesday, when I left home, when I moved out of my parents' house for the, for the, for the last time ever. Um, these, these memories, these things are vivid. Uh, I remember like the, the, the tenor in my dad's voice when I told him at age 16 that my girlfriend was pregnant. And I remember him saying so delicately, have you decided what you're going to do? And I think like that's vivid what he meant, but I don't think I even understood it then. But to have had those experiences, to have had this wealth of experience to draw from is I think at the core of what yields the ability to tell stories. So with that, I think that in, in your own lives, in your own ambitions, however they may manifest, when you look at the idea of, of sharing stories, you know, Lena Dunham, who's a brilliant, brilliant writer, good friend of mine, lovely human being, she always says, like, don't wait for somebody else to tell your story. Tell your story. Look inside and draw from those experiences um, because that's where truths come from. So with that, fast forwarding back to the respectability tour, you know, that project was actually like a mild success, a success in the respect that the guy, the owner of the cable network shows that hired us to make that, he loved it. And... I don't know that anybody even ever saw it, but it was like pretty funny. Uh, and he loved that. And after we met him, he was like, let's do something big together. And he was thinking, make a feature film. I don't know what a feature film, I don't know how to make a feature film. Um, but we ended up making like, I said, here, just bankroll this for a year. And in a year, we'll make a whole bunch of stuff. And at the end of that year, we had like, basically, we just made YouTube videos, but YouTube wasn't around then. We just made like this onslaught of little videos. And we sort of formed and patted them together like you would with like, hamburger meat turned into patties, and we called that a TV show. And then we went and shot that TV show, and we sold that TV show to HBO for a couple million bucks. And that was like, that was such a pivot point. That was such a turning point for me in my career. And they bought that show in 2008, and it didn't air until 2010. And in those two years, I was, you know, it was a hot shot. It was a big deal now. And in those two years, I produced feature films that were wildly successful. The two films that I produced, we premiered both of them at the Cannes Film Festival in France. The second of which we also premiered at Sundance, which like, they never, that never happens. Um, sold them to IFC, got distribution. They were in movie theaters. I won awards for them. Um, and in 2010, which is the height, the peak, the peak, the apex, the crescendo of my career in traditional media, as I won an Independent Spirit Award on a stage that like Natalie Portman was on, it was like on TV, my parents saw it. It was the same time my TV show was literally premiering every Friday night on HBO. It was like the height of success. And I was absolutely miserable. Miserable. Um, I think I can pinpoint the moment, which was like flying home from LA with this huge trophy, this big award in my hand, which was like definitely a threat to national security. They should have never have let me flown with this. <laughs> Um, had these big wings, it was brass, and TSA saw it, and the guy was like, I saw you on TV, man, come on, get through, get through. I was like, that's not how it works. <laughs> but I'm on the plane, and I've got my headphones on, and I was like listening to Radiohead, or one of those songs that, you know, like when you're alone, you get the headphones on, you're like looking at it, you get all nostalgic, and we start crying, what the fuck's wrong with me? Start freaking out. <laughs> I was having one of those moments, and I realized that I worked so hard with my head down with my brother, just making stuff for the pure joy of it for you know, six, seven years. And because of that energy and like that passion for sharing stories and sharing perspectives and sharing ideas, it led us all the way to all this wild success. And the first thing I did when I got that success is I stopped doing the thing that I loved. Instead, I like produced movies because like I got to be at parties with like famous celebrities that were like kissing my ass because I just produced a fancy movie and they wanted to be in the next movie and it made me feel important. But I realized like, that's where the source of my unhappiness came from is because I stepped away from it. And that was the moment that I decided to focus on YouTube. Um, and I, like a lot of people on, on YouTube, you know, like, I started my channel with zero, with nothing. 
And I remember I had like six videos that I put my life into and I had like no views. My kid at the time, who was 12, his friends in like middle school had bigger YouTube channels than me. And I was literally had a show that was premiering every Friday night on HBO. And I was like, this is so unfair. And then I was like, actually, this is completely fair. And that sucks that like my success elsewhere doesn't yield me success here. And, and then I launched this movie. And I, I want to show you this movie because... Um, it's, it's this movie in particular that I think story is everything. This movie, this movie catapulted my career online. This movie got me um, a job with the New York Times. This movie changed policy. This movie, um, this movie had political ramifications. This movie had me on the news globally, literally BBC Global broadcasted everywhere. Al Jazeera picked it up. This movie cost like $30 to make. Um, there was nothing to this movie. Uh, but the story, the story was powerful enough to accomplish all of that. Um, all right, this is two and a half minutes long, so if you get super bored, just forever go take a leak. I'll come grab you when it's over. I'm getting a ticket for riding my bike not in the bike lane. Felony, guilty, not guilty. Everything you need. It's right the fine. You're a bicyclist, so it's, it's anywhere um, from ten dollars uh, up to one hundred. But it's a bicycle summit, it's a bicycle summit, just for not that keep you from probably riding in the bike. <laughs> Listen up. As you've been hearing on our show and elsewhere, the police continue to crack down on biking infractions. As the number of bikers explodes throughout the city, ticketing is on the rise. Casey in Manhattan, you got a ticket this month? Uh, yeah, I got a, a ticket about three weeks ago for riding my bike not in the bike lane. Not in the bike lane. Alex is holding up a sign that says, <laughs> you could have just said it. Oh, okay. His sign says, not illegal. Yeah. I wish I had known that before I paid the $50 ticket. Well, so... Th When I made that, there was like a lot going on in New York City around how bikers were getting in trouble with cops and things like that. And there were hundreds of videos. I think it was Gawker wrote the article specifically about why did this video force the mayor to address it in a press conference when specifically asked about this? Why was this video all over the news? Why was this video the sort of like this conversation piece that everybody's hanging their hat on? Why is it that this video has done, I think, 20 million, 19 million views, something like that? Because when you search bike tickets New York City, you get page after page of like people yelling at the cops, getting yelled at by the cops. Like this exact story by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people captured even better than the way I captured it. <clears throat> and to me, it comes down to one very obvious thing, which is that like in that like really poorly made 
don't know if you can notice all the titles were all screwed up because I only knew how to use iMovie at the time. If any of you ever used iMovie, you have no control of the titles, and you're like, well, I guess that's fine. <laughs> like, all fucked up. Um, but it, it was the story. It was, this was an experience that... It, a lot of people had been dealing with, if you've ever been frustrated in your life with like your cable companies or a ticket or a parking ticket, whatever it might be, you feel that frustration. And all I tried to do with that video is sort of take that frustration and sublimate it into something that was like shareable to share and express my frustration with others. Um, and that video was the, was the inflection point for my career on YouTube. Um, that video is what took my channel from nothing to something and gave me this tremendous audience. And, and I mentioned the New York Times before, but they called me and they're like, hey, we love that video. Um, will you make videos like that for us? And I was like, I think you've got the wrong number. Um, and a, a long relationship was built in the New York Times where my only mandate was they would give me topics that are really uninteresting, like ticketing cyclists in New York City. And they would say, here, make a piece of video that, that shares this in an interesting and compelling way. And that's exactly what I did with them for years. Um, but it was the story. At the core of all of this was the story. And my own career in advertising, which is where I started this talk, um, sort of looked like I would make fun videos. I'd make videos that I loved making, whether they were like the Respectability Tour, the HBO show, feature films, or YouTube videos like this. Brands would see them, they'd say, hey, we'd love that guy. So then their agency would get in touch with me, the agency would go to a production company, the production company would reach out to me, and then I'd say yes, they'd go back to the production, they'd go back to the agency, they'd go back to the client, and they'd say treatment, and they'd go back, and they'd go back. And then eventually I'd show up on set, and if any of you have ever been to a commercial shoot before, you'd know it's like there's literally a tent city where everybody sits and there's a thing set up to my camera so they can see what I'm shooting and then there's a storyboard and a script and there are literally hand-drawn pictures of exactly what the shot should look like, exactly what the kids should say. And I'm like doing this, I'm like, why would they hire me for this? Like, why not just get a robot? Because everything is defined. There was no creative latitude, no opportunity for me to sort of infuse a story. Um, and I expressed this frustration, um, but it fell sort of, it fell on deaf ears and because the paychecks are ridiculous. <laughs> Advertising, so stupid. Um, I kept doing it. I was like, great, yeah, look, I'll take your money. Um, but the product wasn't good. The videos weren't good. And then as I was finding traction with videos like that, um, I sort of went to my commercial agent at the time and I was like, these brands that want to work with me because of these videos, Get them to let me do these videos, but for them. And I remember the owner of the company then, in 2010, she's like, that's not how it works. Um, I immediately stopped working with them. Uh, I think I was their biggest earner on the East Coast, and I immediately ended the relationship. And it was tough, it was tough going, but eventually I connected with Nike, and they're like, yeah, do your thing, man. And we made three videos, two were great and successful, and then the third one, I was like, I'm really gonna do my thing. And I like, basically stole the entire budget. And instead of making a commercial for them, I just lived out one of my fantasies, which is to show up at an airport and buy whatever the next plane ticket out was, and just kept doing that until the entire budget had evaporated. Um, <laughs> and that led me and my, my buddy all around the world in like weird, scary places like in Kenya right after a huge terrorist attack and like trapped in the Middle East and like weird Southeast Asia, like it just got gnarly. Um, but we made a video that shared that story. Video, by the way, that had no Nike products and not even a swoosh in it. Nike saw it and they're like, is this an advertisement for Patagonia? Because I see your Patagonia coat, Casey. <laughs> um, and I was like, I'm sorry. But you know, that video was, I think for four, until the last World Cup, that was the most watched video that Nike had ever made. Um, and to this day is, is, is sort of uh, something that I still get hired and make us a video like that because the story was so real, it was my story. It was just a story that I truly wanted to share, a story that I wanted to tell. And there happened to be real alignment with the story that I wanted to share that was my story and the story that the brand was trying to communicate. Um, so with that, I'm gonna end this talk, so we have time for Q&A, with not the Nike movie, which is, um, which is what I was going to show you. Instead, I wanna show you a successor to the Nike movie. Um, so I don't take full credit for it, but maybe I'll take all the credit for it, but like this movement and advertisement for like inspirational advertising, which is like... <sighs> um, after the Nike piece, I know, 
after the Nike piece, you know, like literally Mark Parker, the CEO of Nike, called me and he's like, man, I saw your video for us. I got to get out of the office more. <laughs> um, but that's all anybody wanted. They wanted me to make that to the point where brands literally called me. They're like, hey, we'll just give you all this money. Do whatever you want. Make it cool, bro. <laughs> um, it got like really uninteresting really fast. Because I'd be like, okay, and they're like, hey, what are you going to do? Like, not, like, you, did you, that's not how this transaction... Um, it got old fast, to the point where like, I no longer pursue gigs like that. Like, it doesn't... But one opportunity came up, and it was one of those. They're like, here's a check, and it was a big check. It was 25,000 bucks, and like, do whatever you want. And then I was like, what do you mean, whatever I want? And they're like, we want something inspirational. And I was like, oh, fuck that, you're kidding me. Um, <laughs> But then I had an idea and I called them back and I took the money. And I'm gonna show you the video that I made now because this video has nothing to do with anything but story. This video was purely and only about story. And if I didn't put it in text on the screen, you might not know why this video is being made at all because this video is just about that story. Um, so I'm gonna play this now and then I think we're gonna do a little bit of a Q&A. Okay, so this is the actual correspondence. Dear Casey, 20th Century Fox is releasing a new movie, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. We want to run a campaign under the concept, Live Your Dreams. The collective theme of this initiative will be to motivate, inspire, and give people a catalyst to do something they've never done. We'd like to know if you'd be interested in creating a video about living your dreams. And this is the actual response I sent to them. Here's my concept. Give me the budget, I'll go to the Philippines and spend every penny helping people in need. Okay, so... Thank you for your help. So we're gonna try to clean this place out. So how many of these do you have? This is what the secret life of Walter Mitty's promotional video budget looks like. So we just arrived. We're unloading the buses with the help of all these people. No idea who these people are. I guess this is the house we're gonna be staying in tonight. There's no electricity or anything here, but they do have generators.
think that we bought enough food. Thanks, guys.